Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tri Lakes United Methodist Church. My name is Jason Baxter. I'm the associate pastor here at Tri Lakes. Pastor Bob is actually traveling this week. He's back in the holy city of Wilmore, Kentucky, which is where he went to seminary, where I went to seminary to. He sent us a picture of himself this morning. He's standing there at the John Wesley statue. Um, we're going to probably be sent it. We were going to show it to you. But um, Pastor Bob just wanted to send his greetings, and he, oh, there he is. <laughs> so Wesley's about three feet tall in real life. That's a life-size statue, and so it's kind of weird to stand next to him. But anyways, Pastor Bob sends his greetings. We're going to continue our sermon series on the topic of original sin. Just want to say thank you to Bob for giving me this topic as one of my last sermons. Next time, maybe we'll look at demon possession or something like that. I, I do get to talk about grace next week, so um, I'm, I'm happy to be able to do that. Well, our scripture this morning that we're going to primarily work from is Genesis chapter 6, in particular verse 5. But I'm going to read the first eight verses. So if you have your scripture with you, hear these words from the Lord. When the people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be counted 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth all the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we do want to thank you for this opportunity to gather to be, to be together here this morning, to celebrate you, to be in your presence, and to hear your word. We pray, Lord, that this morning that our, our hearts would be open to you, that our minds would be open to you, to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, this week they finally set a date for my ordination for the fourth time. <laughs> no, don't clap yet. No, no clapping until this is done, okay? So it was supposed to happen in June of last year, but that got canceled because of COVID. Then they moved it to June of this year, but they thought, hey, we're having an annual conference in October. That'd be a great time to do it. So they canceled that event, moved it to October. Well, now cases are spiking. So they moved that October event to a virtual event. And I got an email this week saying that I am slated to be ordained on November 6th. Now, I am not holding my breath until the bishop lays hands on me and this thing is done but I am hoping to finally bring this long and arduous process to an end. Now, most of you know, and you're tired of hearing about it, but you get to some more today. This was a long, frustrating process for me with, with a number of delays. And one of the things that was so frustrating for me as I was going through this process is in the first two years of it, you have to go to these retreats where supposedly you're there to learn skills uh, that you didn't learn in seminary, practical skills for ministry. That's what was supposed to happen, uh, but that's not what happened most of the time. And one of the things, one of the times it really frustrated me, it was like my second to last one. It was in 2018. Uh, we were up there in Denver, and I remember I got particularly frustrated this day. We were listening, we're having a time of devotion, and they played a video by this Catholic priest named Father Gregory Boyle. And Father Boyle has this incredible ministry to former gang members in the Los Angeles area. And so just, uh, I'm going to pick on him a little bit this morning. So um, I want to 
give you a little more context. I actually have deep respect for what he does. So he was first appointed to this little church, to the Dolores Mission Church, back in 1986. And when he arrived there, this was the, had the this place, his, his parish, had the highest concentration of gang activity of anywhere in Los Angeles. And at that moment, at that time in history, Los Angeles was the center of gang activity worldwide. So he was at the epicenter of some really difficult things that were going on and the way that that was impacting his community. So two years later, he opened up the doors to something called Homeboy Ministries, which was reaching out to people that were trying to make changes in their lives. They were trying to come out of their association with gangs and become contributing members of society. And so this ministry would become the largest intervention ministry in the world for former gang members. Every year, 10,000 people will walk through these doors to participate in an 18-month program where they're given a job, they're offered services like tattoo removals, uh, anger management, um, parenting classes, all kinds of things as they try to change their lives and turn them around. So what Father Boyle does is remarkable. Few of us can say that we have been on the front lines of ministry the way he has. So I have a great deal of admiration for him. Well, part of his ministry is that he shares this thing called a thought for the day. It's a short video, usually about five minutes or so. It gets posted on YouTube. And it was one of these videos that we were watching for our time of devotion. The title of his video was Remember Who You Really Are. And Father Boyle began his message by stating that a number of Buddhist texts begin with the following statement. O nobly born, remember who you really are. Now, that may not sound so bad, but one of the things that frustrated me to no end was we were always talking about Buddhist texts at these events, even though this was a training for Christian clergy. And so... My eyes just kind of rolled. I was like, here we go again. Great. More, more Buddhism, no scripture. And that's not entirely fair. There was more scripture than that. But it just bothered me the way we had our focus constantly diverted. And then he went on to quote this poet, this, this unnamed poet. And he quoted, this poet wrote and, and said, sometimes it is necessary to remind a thing of its loveliness. And he said that when people come through those doors, they don't need to learn how to be better people or become good people even. They need to learn who they really are. And I thought, hmm, okay, where's he going with this? And then he told the story about a statue of the Buddha in Thailand. It's this huge, monstrous statue. And I thought, great. Back to Buddhism again. Wonderful. Here we go. So there's this huge 800-year-old statue in Thailand. And it's covered with it's this gray, drab, dreary-looking thing. Um, but it started to crack because it was so old. And apparently, if you go up to these cracks, one of our members came up to me between services. He's been to it. You can look through these cracks, and you see gold, pure gold down there on the inside. And so what happened is there was this, this statue of the Buddha that is made of pure gold, but it's been covered with this clay, this drab gray outside. And the strategy there was to do that so that people wouldn't want to steal it, so that looters wouldn't come and try to take the statue from, it, from them. And so after sharing this illustration, Father Boyle concludes this, that we are just like that statue, that on the inside, we are golden. We are pure gold. Sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, and on the inside, we're golden. Is that true? That's what I was sitting there with. I was shocked to hear a Catholic priest talk about human nature in this way because his anthropology, his understanding of human nature seemed to completely ignore the very thing that required an organization like Homeboy Industries to exist in the first place, and that's sin. 
And so I'm sitting there, and everyone in the room is shaking their head in affirmation. They're nodding in affirmation, and I'm shaking my head going, what about sin? We can't not talk about that, right? We can't just say we're golden inside and move on. That doesn't capture the full picture. Now, I'm as guilty as the next person. I love to argue over theology. One of the things I will miss most is the nerdy conversations that Bob and I have about things that you could care less about. But it is so much fun for us. But there's one theological argument that I'll never understand. I don't understand why we have it. And it's this argument over sin. Now, in my mind, of all the doctrines that we hold, the one that has the most evidence, if we just look inside our hearts, if we look around our world, the doctrine with the most evidence is sin. And yet we seem to not even be able to agree on that. Now, you might disagree with me when it comes to original sin or whatever, but the fact that sin is a problem in this world, the fact that our world is deeply broken, the fact that if we are really honest and we look inside ourselves, we're deeply broken. And that results in a brokenness in this world. Now, you, many of you know I'm about to transition to becoming a chaplain at a drug and alcohol treatment center. I'm going to be working with people that are they're going through the 12 steps. And what is first step? What is the first step of that program? It's coming to admit that you have a problem with addiction and that your life has become unmanageable because of it. So the issue here in step one is denial. It's about coming out of denial and admitting that we have a problem. Now, lest we relegate this kind of denial just to the recovery community, it's well and alive in our culture today. Most of us simply don't want to admit that sin is a real problem, that it's causing havoc in our lives and in our world. This kind of denial is in the very cultural waters in which we sin. And this isn't new. We tend to think it is, but this is not new. This is human nature to not want to face up to this. Hear what Wesley wrote in his sermon, Original Sin. This is back in somewhere around 1757, 58, I believe. It is now quite unfashionable to talk otherwise, to say anything to the disparagement of human nature, which is generally allowed, notwithstanding a few infirmities, to be very innocent and wise and virtuous. So even back in his day, 300-year-old, 250 or so years ago, there was this tendency to want to not deal with the fact that human beings struggle with sin. And you might remember that I recently got to preach outside at our outdoor service. We talked about the story of Mary and Martha there in Luke chapter 10. And the key point of that sermon was that we need to welcome back nuance into our thinking. We need to welcome that back into how we look at other people and how we view things. Because it's totally absent from our culture today. It is all one way or it is all the other. And yet, when we looked at the story of Mary and Martha, what we saw is that she wasn't this villain that she's normally portrayed as. Martha was a woman who passionately wanted to lavish service on Jesus. Now, sure, she didn't understand the moment, but she wanted to serve Jesus. And we also talked about how if Mary sat there long enough, she would know that she can't sit there any longer that she needs to get up and serve as well. So to read this text, to get a true and accurate picture of Martha required nuance. I want to suggest to you today that as we think about human nature, it requires a similar type of nuance. There's this road that we're on. There's a ditch on either side that we need to avoid. On one side of the road, we run into the ditch that sin isn't a problem. On the other side of the road, we run into the problem that it has so corrupted us that we are now worthless, which isn't true either. So I want to focus this morning about on, on original sin, but at the end, I want to come back to this idea that we're made in the image of God. 
Because to have a true and mature Christian understanding that is faithful to the scriptures requires holding these two things in tension with each other. We are deeply broken, but we are also made in the image of God. So let me share with you a little bit about Wesley's sermon. We're going through this series to try to present basic Wesleyan doctrine. And so Wesley has this sermon called Original Sin. It's a summary, a a, a quote-unquote shorter summary of this larger tract that he wrote. And he takes Genesis 6-5 as his main text. Genesis 6-5, as you may remember, we just read it, said, The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And so in this sermon, as Wesley thinks about human nature in light of Genesis 6-5, what he's doing is he's looking at what he calls the natural state of human beings. And according to Scripture, and especially supported by Genesis 6, as Wesley read it, the scriptural case is closed when it comes to humanity. This is what Wesley said. But no man has naturally any delight in God. In our natural state, we cannot conceive how anyone should delight in him. We take no pleasure in him at all. He is utterly tasteless to us. To love God, it is far above us, out of our sight. We cannot naturally attain to it. Now, Bob argued last week, rightly so, that we are made in the image of God. And in Wesley's understanding, there were three aspects of that image. There's the natural image, there's the political image, and the moral image. Well, those first two ideas, the natural and the political image of God, Wesley argued that those remained, that there was still a remnant of those in human nature. It wasn't completely erased. But the moral image, he argued, was completely erased from human nature. That when we stand apart from God, we cannot choose to do good. We cannot respond to the promptings of God. The Holy Spirit. And so Wesley quoted, turned to verses like Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, which says, The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They, all al- they are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Paul quotes from here. And then he notes that in Romans 3, Paul quotes this very same psalm in his analysis of human nature. And so Wesley's argument is that this is a continuing problem. This wasn't just a problem in Genesis 6. It's a problem we see throughout Scripture. And if we look at our world, we see that it's still a promise, or it's still a problem now. So Wesley argued that humanity, when we are left to our own devices, we are totally and utterly depraved. At this point, we agree with the Calvinists, but we're going to depart, especially next week when we talk about free grace. Now, Wesley anticipated some objections. He asked this question, but was there not good mingled with the evil? Was there not light intermixed with the darkness? His answer, no, none at all. I don't know about you, but when I read this, I was like, that is completely untethered untethered from reality. What in the world are you talking about? Because when we look at the world, we do see people doing good. People that hate God, don't want anything to do with God. We see them doing good things. So what in the world is Wesley talking about? Well, there's a sentence in his sermon that's real easy to miss. He writes this shortly after that. We are not here to consider what the grace of God might occasionally work in his soul. So what Wesley is looking at is the human person completely apart from the grace of God. And if we take the human being completely apart from the grace of God, when it comes to our moral nature, there is no good that we can do. And Wesley acknowledged that no person actually lives in this state. He said that every, every man has some measure of light, that no one lives in mere nature. And he talked about prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is this grace that goes ahead of us. It's this grace that restores the image of God within us, that moral image enough so that we can respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and so that we can do good. 
And so what prevenient grace does is it gives us response ability. Apart from the grace of God, we do not have the ability to respond to God. That's what we affirm. But because of the prevenient grace of God that goes before us, it gives us the ability to, prompt, to respond to these promptings of the Spirit. It's a powerful grace. And so no one lives in a near natu- natural state. But this idea, this idea of our total corruption has to be held in tension. This idea that we are also made in the image of God. And Wesley said that image was defaced, but it was not entirely erased in us. And so what God's ultimate plan and desire to do, the goal of salvation as Wesleyans, is that that image be fully restored in us in accordance with God's original intention. This isn't something that we've made up. This goes way back in to the early roots of church history. St. Athanasius put it this way. You know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes obliterated through external stains? The artist does not throw away the panel, but the subject of the portrait has to come and sit for it again, and the likeness is redrawn on the same material. Even so, It was with the all-holy Son of God. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that he might renew mankind made after himself. The eternal word became human so that the beauty of God's original intentional image might be redrawn on the canvas of human beings. That's what God was and is doing in Christ. The question is, will we say yes or no to God's desire to restore that? I'm going to come back to Father Boyle's message and just reconsider a couple of things. Whenever, if I, I know some of you in here, I'm looking around, we've been in the new member class together. On the first week of our new, of our new member class, as we cover basic doctrine, we talk about original sin. And I love to introduce that topic with this question. Are human beings fundamentally good or are they fundamentally bad? Now, I'm not one of them, but most people are wise enough to not blurt out an answer right away. They realize the difficulty of this question. And so you can see the the wheels spinning in people's heads as they have this pensive look on their face. But I... We'll just let it be silent for a while. And eventually, the awkwardness of this silence gets so painful that someone will offer an answer. And it doesn't matter what they said. Someone else in the group will say the exact opposite thing, and so the fun begins. And we have a great conversation about human nature. And so the question that I'm asking here, and to put it in Father Boyle's language, is are we golden inside? Or are we clay? Which one is it? I used to think that there was an easy answer to this question. I was the guy that would blurt out, we're bad, done. Case closed, end of story, let's move on. I am so aware of my own brokenness and the brokenness of our world that it just seems so obvious to me. Like I said, there's a ditch on this road of understanding human nature that we have to be aware of. On one side, we run into this ditch of ignoring sin and saying that it's not a problem, that we are golden inside, and we ignore that. And on the other side of the ditch, we ignore the fact that we are made in the image of God, and we think because of the things we have said, done, and thought, we are worthless. And those are the two groups of people that were on my heart as I prepared the sermon this week. I think there are some of us that walk into these doors in a state of denial about the severity of the problem of sin in their own lives and in our world. The truth is, is there are areas in each one of our lives, I don't care what we come in here presenting 
on Sunday morning, there are unmanageable areas of every individual's life in this room because of the problem of sin. No one is excluded from that. Some of us don't want to admit that and deal with it. But Wesley ended his sermon on original sin this way. Know your disease and know your cure. You can't get the cure until you first admit that there's a disease, that there's a problem. So first we have to know our disease before we can get that cure of Christ remaking the image of God in our lives. But I'm also painfully aware, some of you in this room, we've had conversations about this. Some folks come into this room with such a deep awareness of their own sin and their own brokenness and such shame over what they've done in their lives that it's completely overridden the notion that we're made in the image of God. They carry such a large amount of shame that it's overridden that other idea. That was my mistake. I thought that I was so bad that I could undo the handiwork of God. And to a degree, we were left in that situation. Apart from God's grace, it is utterly hopeless. But God's work is more powerful than our ability to destroy it. And so he created this opportunity for us to be restored in the image of God. And so the question is, will we say yes? So I have two reflection questions for us this morning. The first one is, have I been in denial about the reality of sin? Is there some area in my life, or just at large, am I denying this? And number two, have I believed that I am worthless because of sin? Because that is a lie as well. And here is where I change my mind and I agree with something that Father Boyle said. Sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. Now hear me, that loveliness is not something that we possess. It's not something that we created within ourselves. It is a derived loveliness from being made in the, in the image of God. It is a gift to us. And we dare not set that aside. And there are some of us in this room who need to be reminded, yep, you are made in the image of God. It's not just all about your sin. We have to hold these things in tension to have a mature understanding of sin. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you now to just spend some time in silence, we pray that you would speak to each one of us, Lord. Lord, the truth of the matter is, is that it would be wrong of us to think that we can answer these questions in black and white. The truth is, is that each one of us comes in this morning in denial about some area of our lives. Each one of us comes in here carrying some shame that disregards the fact that you have made us in your image. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see the places where we've been blind. We pray that you open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to also absorb the fact that we are made in your image. And for anyone who comes in here today feeling worthless, Lord, would your grace and your presence point out that ugly lie and make it go away. In Jesus' name we pray.